a Sunday's fridge cam. Thank you, thank you. Now, our Lost and Hungry tour across America was fantastic. However, I was slightly disappointed by the Philly cheesesteak. I was really just looking one forward dish. to it. Just one dish. What should I do? How can I make it better? You gave me loads of tips, and now I'm going to show Barry how to do it. Right, we need to toast this. Basically, that means it doesn't get all soggy with all the juices. That's why I was so disappointed with it when we ate it, because I was like, my expectations were up here. Mm. And the result probably wasn't bad, but it didn't meet my expectations. Very... <laughs> Now, I like this sort of food, guys. I think they've been making great food content on YouTube for years, but what happens is on this platform, people get a little aggressive with the titling from time to time, and they start throwing in those extra, you know, sprinkling in those extra words for hits, like most amazing, best ever, greatest, whatever it is, and I totally understand, but when it comes to the Philly cheesesteak, that's where I draw the line. That's where things get a little personal because I grew up outside of Philadelphia and I've been eating cheesesteaks my whole life. And to call this the best cheesesteak recipe ever, I don't think so. And I think what happened was, you know, they went over to Philadelphia, they had a disappointing cheesesteak, and then they came back and recreated their own version. And it looked like, you know, a delicious steak sandwich, but to call it the best Philly cheesesteak ever, that is a problem because there were many flaws to the actual sandwich. So I'm here to, uh, to kind of stand up for my hometown cheesesteak and show you guys what a real cheesesteak is. But I myself have to go on a bit of a journey. This is the sandwich series. We're making everything from scratch. I need to do a little more research. So for episode 10, we are headed back to my hometown of Philadelphia to learn all things cheesesteak. So we're headed to Jim's, your, your favorite cheesesteak place, and, and what makes it what makes it the best? When I was a kid, I worked on 9th Street in the Italian market, and Pat's was about two blocks away from the store, and we used to eat Pat's every weekend. And what's Pat's like? Is that Pat's is Pat's is an old school, long time cheesesteak place. Maybe maybe the first one. I'm not sure. Maybe the most famous. Maybe the most famous. It's the one that does kind of get the credit in Philadelphia. And everybody, people just go there for the, for the name. And we used to eat there all the time and it was good. And then when I got a little bit older, we started to go to gyms. Gyms was a, a spot where you go to a concert, you see music, and then after it was over, you still wanted to hang out and talk about the show. So you go to gyms and have a cheesesteak. And after eating gyms, we found out it was just a little better than Pat's. That was it, you were converted. What makes it better? It, we liked it because the the um, the at, the atmosphere inside is good. It's an inside place, so if it's winter time, you can go inside instead of standing out on the street. And the meat they they chop the meat up so that when you take a bite out of the sandwich, you're not getting a whole stringy long piece of meat with it. So Pat's does the full on pieces of Pat, steak. Yeah, Pat's just lays the steak on, and um, I think James also gives you a little bit more meat. More so, meat. A little bit more meat. This is Jim's at 4th and South Street. Uh, so we're known as Jim Steaks, Jim Steaks South Street, Jim South Street. Um, we are a famous steak and hoagie um, shop in Philadelphia and been here since 1976. And what has changed over the years? Not much. Not much. Yeah, not much has changed. We're a lot busier now than we were when we first opened up. But as far as changes to actual product or what we do here, nothing's really changed. On a busy Saturday, we can sell up to 2,500 sandwiches. 2,475 of them are cheesesteaks. What do you think makes it so popular? Well, in Philadelphia, it is our sandwich. We're known for cheesesteaks, roast pork sandwiches, soft pretzels. So when you come to Philadelphia, you have to get a cheesesteak. I think what makes a cheesesteak so special is that it's simple. It's not pretending to be something else. Cheesesteak is, you know, three ingredients, beef, roll, and cheese. And that's, in essence, you know, three amazing ingredients put together. 
There isn't a whole lot you have to do to a cheesesteak to make it a great sandwich. So anybody can make a pretty good cheesesteak. So anyone can make a good cheesesteak. A pretty good cheesesteak. A pretty good cheesesteak. What steak. makes a great cheesesteak? A great cheesesteak uh, starts with a great roll. The, the combination of its softness and the way it's baked is, is a great platform for our sandwich. Next comes the beef. Now, you have to use a really high grade of beef. So we only use top round. Uh, we only use choice black Angus beef um, that we slice here, slicing right in the back now. So we have a, an oil, which is a kind of a proprietary oil that we use here. It's the, um, I, I believe that we're the only people that do serve this oil. I'm not at liberty to disclose what that oil is off camera, I'll tell you. But that helps season our beef because we don't use any dry seasoning at all. We don't use any additional seasoning. We want you to be able to taste the beef. Next is you know your cheese. You know we use American provolone, and we sell more cheese whiz than anything else. Uh, cheese whiz is kind of has become the essence of the Philly cheesesteak. Even though when Philly cheesesteaks were first invented back in the 30s, there was no cheese whiz. Where did the cheese whiz come from? Where Kraft created the cheese whiz in in, in the 60s. Okay. And, uh, and it just made its way. Into and it just made its way. It's perfect. It, it it gets into the beef, especially the way we serve it, because we chop our meat. We don't serve it in the slab. Okay. So that cheese whiz just kind of gets into the meat, and it, and every bite you get cheese. And what's your favorite part about being in the cheese business? People. People. Yeah. Uh, people behind the counter and the people on the other side of the counter. It's a constant. Uh, making a new friend every single day. It's different than a lot of other businesses where you're seeing the same people all the time. Here, half of our business are people that we may ne never see again, but once you come in our door, you're a friend. Now what most people don't know is that the reason the cheesesteak is so good is because of the bread it's served on. And the reason the bread is so good is because there's a really big Italian population that's been in Philadelphia for decades making incredible bread. Because you can get, you know, great steak, great cheese anywhere, but to replicate the style of bread that they serve in Philadelphia, it is very difficult and there's a lot of places around the world that you know they try to open a Philly cheesesteak place and they fail miserably because they can't get that bread. Specifically the Amoroso Baking Company, they're the most popular and they just make this soft and fluffy and chewy. It's just a perfect long roll four steak sandwich and we are gonna do our best to recreate it at home, which is no easy task. I have not seen anyone successfully do this at home. So we're gonna start out by blooming some yeast with one cup of warm water and half a cup of milk. Add your one package of yeast. Then I add two tablespoons of sugar and I'm gonna be adding a special ingredient called amylase enzyme right here. So this is a starch conversion aid and it says it converts starches into fermentable sugars. And I actually saw Chef Steps use this in a sandwich roll recipe and they said that it just makes the rolls a little bit softer, more like store-like and that's what I'm going for for this roll. So we're gonna add five grams of this stuff now here is my new Bosch mixer. Bosch was nice enough to send me one of these things, which is so exciting because it's gonna make my, my bread recipe so much easier. Just look at this dough hook right here. That is serious. I'm gonna add in my flour and then add in my salt and just turn it on a low speed to incorporate those two. Then once the yeast is bloomed and it looks like this, you can add that to the flour and then just turn it on a low speed for about one minute until everything is incorporated. Then you're gonna let it relax for about 15 minutes before you move on. Now I'll turn it back to a low speed and let it go for about 10 to 15 minutes until you really start to develop that gluten structure. Once it rests, you should be able to perform a little stretch test right here. So you wanna be able to see through the dough without breaking it too much. Now that was my first time using the mixer, but it worked great and I'm really excited for future bread recipes. If you guys want one of these things, Bosch is offering a $60 off coupon code. Click in the description below to access that. Now just take the dough out and give it a final knead in some flour and then put it in a bowl with some oil and we're gonna put that in the refrigerator to rise and ferment overnight, a nice slow fermentation. When you wake up the next morning, you can divide that dough into four pieces and then you are going to shape your long rolls.
here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna slide these right down to the top rack. And we've got this pan preheating in there. Oops. And we are going to throw on some ice cubes, which are gonna create the steam we need to really help those spring up in the oven and create a nice crust. All right, it's been 10 minutes. Those look great. I'm just gonna rotate these so they look evenly. Wow. Put them in for another 10 minutes. So I put the bread in a plastic bag overnight to soften even more, and the texture is just perfect. You want that softness. That's the classic Philly roll. The smell too smells exactly like a store-bought bread, which I've never had before. I don't know if it's from the amylase enzyme or what, but I think we did a great job replicating the Amoroso. So not all Philly cheesesteaks are created equal. You know, everyone has their own tricks and techniques. And when it comes to the meat, you know, people have different thoughts. A lot of people use ribeye or top round. So I wanted to get some non-biased information from our friend Ansel over at Fleischer's to really break down what would be the best meat for a Philly cheesesteak. There are a lot of really great options when you're making Philly cheesesteak. The classic is ribeye. It's fatty and it's flavorful. The problem is it's become very famous, so it's pretty expensive. It's a very coveted cut, and it's not usually not your best choice if you're gonna be making cheesesteaks. Personally, I'd recommend chalkeye. It's much more affordable, but it's just as fatty and flavorful as the ribeye. What is chalkeye? Chalkeye comes from the shoulder. It's part of the main muscle. It's actually, when you look at a cow, the chakai leads into the ribeye. There are certainly other good options. Top round is a pretty common one. It's also very affordable. The biggest issue with it is it's pretty lean. It's not gonna have the same flavor that chakai or ribeye would get you. Other options include bottom round, which is also from the same muscle group as the top round. It's a bit fattier than the top round, but personally, again, I'd recommend chakai. So what would you tell your butcher to uh, prepare if you wanted to make cheesesteaks? you're gonna to wanna to get what is called shabu shabu cut beef, or beef that's been sliced thinly on a deli slicer. You'll always wanna give your butcher shop about a day's notice before picking it up, because they'll need to freeze it overnight before they can slice it. If you're crunched for time, you can usually find it at specialty Asian grocers, because it's very popular in dishes like Hot Pot. When it comes to making your own oil or fat for cooking cheesesteaks, what would you recommend? Rendering your own animal fat is super easy. All you need to do is mince up the animal fat, add it to a crock pot with about a half cup of water, let it go on low for six to eight hours. You just need to stir it every hour or so to make sure it doesn't burn. After about six to eight hours, what will be left in your pot is all liquid fat and what's called cracklings, which are the fat structures and little bits of meat left over in the fat. You'll strain it through a cheesecloth lined strainer, let it come to room temperature on your counter, and you can refrigerate it for six months or freeze it for two years. So Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love, and I think at the core that is very true, but on the outside you can get something a little bit different. You know, the, the sports fans, they're, they're known as like super aggressive, and that is very true, they're very intense. And when you go to one of these Philadelphia cheesesteak establishments, they can be, uh, let's say, a little abrasive, a, a little intense, and sometimes it's scary to order and you gotta get it right. So I'm bringing in my friend Julian, who, who I would say is a Philly slang expert, and he's gonna teach you the ways to order a cheesesteak in Philadelphia. Well, I mean, people in Philadelphia take cheesesteaks to a <laughs> very high regard. Uh, so you need to come prepared. Recite that order over and over in your head. Um, while you're in line leading up to. Um, and it's a very proudful, edgy, you know, people of Philadelphia. So you have to get it right or they'll see right through you. So take me through when you're going to order a cheesesteak, you know, how, how do you want to sound so they don't see right through you? You have to sound confident. Like you have to go up there and acting like you've been there before, even if you haven't. Okay. You have to go, your cheese of choice first. Yeah. You have to let them know, American, whiz, wit or without. So for me, people find me a little, you know, off color, but I like whiz. Um, I go whiz wit, whiz wit. And it's a quick cadence and it's, you know, no H in the T, it's whiz wit. Ah, so that's it. Just whiz wit means cheese with onions. Cheese whiz with onions, correct. So what if you want, you know, provolone without onions? You go up to the counter and you go, provolone, no onions. 
You gotta let them know, no onions. <laughs> Don't throw them in there. And yeah. what's great is like the onions also add such a great element to it. I mean, the my, my father asked for burnt onions. That dude yeah. loves a fried onion on that cheesesteak. So tell me about uh, if I'm your cousin, you want to go get a cheesesteak with me down in the city. Just just tell me how that would go. Yeah. So I mean, look, not everyone's fortunate to have season tickets to the Eagles. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> what you what you would do is you go down, you get yourself parked down there in Passionk Avenue, roll early, go down there, get a couple cheesers, you know, get a couple steak sandwiches, and you go back to your cousin's crib, and you sit down there, and you enjoy your steak sandwiches, you watch the birds win, hopefully, but, uh, you know, it's a typical day, and you know, maybe take a walk around the block, say hello to the cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Go back for supper, but it's really you get in there early, you get yourself a cheeser, you, you sit on the couch, you watch the goals, you watch the eggles, and you go from there. But it starts and stops at the cheesers. So I'm sure most of you know how to dice an onion, but I'll give you a quick tutorial to get those perfect caramelized onions. So you can see I left the root on there. So what you're gonna do is take your knife Give it just a few slices this way. Boom, I did three. A few slices this way. Turn it. And then when you get to the edge, just flip it and go around so you don't waste any onion at all. So you saw gems, you throw the meat on and you can slice it up on the actual griddle. I don't have a big space for that. I don't have a huge griddle. So I'm just gonna give it some pre-chopping here so I don't have to actually chop it up on the griddle. Just a rough chop. I'm not mincing this or turning this into ground beef. I'm just chopping it up into these little pieces so you still get some nice steak chunks. I'm gonna use a nice big cast iron skillet here on like a medium low heat. Just, you know, a nice even heat throughout the whole cooking process, almost like you would be cooking on a big flat top grill. Our dry aged beef fat, you can see if it's cool in your house, it will solidify. We're gonna go in with some of that to cook up these onions. Now the key to good caramelized onions is really just patience. Just slowly cooking them over a low heat, letting those sugars develop. You're not like quickly trying to fry them and turn them brown. But I'm also not going for like an extremely low and slow caramelized onions. There's, there's levels to it. I'm going somewhere in the middle and also a little bit of salt will help the, the browning process as well. We're getting there, the sugars are starting to caramelize, but we need a little more color. Just about there, it's been probably 10 minutes stirring these so they don't burn. Looking amazing. They taste amazing and they still have a nice texture to them, which is important. You still wanna retain some bite. So I don't need all of these onions for one sandwich, so I'm gonna scoop some out and just sweep everything over to one side. Let those onions stay nice and warm on this side of the pan. Now we're gonna go in with more beef fat and then in with our beef. I'm gonna keep it at the same heat too. Of course, salt that. I'll throw some pepper on that. Now you're really just looking to cook the redness out of the meat. Some people will do a harder brown on the meat, but you know, when it's so thin, it's like you don't want to dry it out. We will combine the onions with the beef. So here's the key to assembling your cheesesteak. Number one, this has to fit in the pan, your bread roll. So we are just gonna cut off the edges there. Now, of course, slice this down the side, but don't go all the way through. Just open it up, wow. <laughs> this is a straight up Philly roll right here. Okay, now we're gonna stack the meat in the shape of our sandwich. This is key right here. Then we're gonna lay our cheese right over top to melt. I'm using provolone, which has always been my favorite. You can use American, that's pretty classic. Of course, Cheese Whiz. I'm not a big Cheese Whiz fan, the processed stuff, not for me. Now I'll just take a lid like that. All right, cheese melted. Look at that, it will continue to melt in the sandwich, of course. Now we're gonna take our roll, just like you saw at Jam's, and just boom, right over, okay? Now this is the hardest part, and it makes it a lot more difficult because I don't have a big pan, but I have to scoop that back into 
the actual bread roll. I need like, let's see, maybe two spatulas. Can I do two spatulas? Is that even possible? Is this even possible? Ah! Oh, yes. This is what a cheesesteak should look like. Super gooey, cheese melted all the way through. Beautiful beef, still nice and juicy, caramelized onions. There you go. I'm proud of this thing. I haven't even tasted it yet, but I feel like I did Philly well, you know, sort of food. They were disappointed with the Philly cheesesteak. They decided to craft their own version. This is a true Philly cheesesteak, but the official taste test. Oh boy. There's a reason that some sandwiches are so popular and they don't change for decades. And the Philly cheesesteak is a great example of one that's so simple, but everything together, the softness, the, the beef, the, the cheesiness, the caramelized onions, it's so simple at the core, but it's just incredible. And you take one bite, at least for me, I get transformed right back to eating cheesesteaks at home. It's so good. It is so good. Listen, it's not something you want to be eating every day, but it's just such a treat. Like Julian said, you head down to the game, you get yourself a few cheesers. And when it comes to like picking a cheesesteak place, what I was realizing is it's really about tradition. It's, it's what you grew up on. If it's your local pizza shop in Philadelphia, they're probably making good cheesesteaks. You know, I've had so many good cheesesteaks from just around my neighborhood. But then it's like, yeah, you know, my dad liked gym, so that's the place I grew up on. That's what I like. I don't think I've ever tasted one this freaking good. And I'm like salivating just thinking about eating the rest of this. But make sure you follow me at Life by Mike G. I'm teasing out uh, episodes of the sandwich series and giving away prizes if you get them right. Definitely try making it at home. If you're in Philly, try a cheesesteak. I know the sort of food guys were disappointed. I don't know where they ate at, but this is the true stuff right here. Dude, when you come to Philadelphia, you have to come to Jim's on South Street, number one, hip and street in town. And in fact, we have the best cheesesteaks in the country. So number one, because it's Black Angus. Number two, the atmosphere. And number three, it's the customer. That's what makes Jim's so great. <laughs> have one when you get a chance. <laughs> Amazing.